Have any of you ever experienced, or maybe you've even done it, I see this mostly at drive throughs where the person in front of the person behind the person will pay for their meal. You guys know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever have it done to you? Anybody experience that? Cool. That's, that, that's pretty cool, right? And when you live out here, you find out that fast food is really expensive. And so if somebody's willing to pick up your, uh, your McDonald's burger or whatever like that, that, that is truly a blessing. It's starting like, to impact your, your livelihood at that point. Um, it's referred to as paying it forward. That's the term that I guess has become known in, in our culture. Uh, it became such a, a known phenomenon, I guess. They even did a movie many years ago called Pay It Forward, which is a real kind of a heart-wrenching movie now if you even watch it. But that idea of paying it forward is something that, that, that people really respond to. And I've seen it done at, um, at Starbucks before. I've even seen it in, in, in uh, you know, drug stores and convenience stores where somebody will say, I'll, I'll take care of them, just paying it forward. But folks, I want to let you know that even though this may be a fairly new phenomenon when it comes to American culture, that God was doing this many, many years before we figured out about it. As a matter of fact, he actually lays it out in the scriptures. Did you know that? We're going to go there this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to encourage you to turn to the beginning of the, sec the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians. We're going to look at a few verses at the very beginning of that letter in a sermon, you guessed it, entitled, Pay It Forward. All right? Usually when I preach out of these different epistles, these letters that Paul wrote, I have to give you a little context. But since we're at the very, very beginning, maybe the best context this morning is just to start and read it. We're going to actually focus on verses 3 and 4, but let me read the first couple of verses. And then we'll jump into the passage for this morning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In case you don't know where Corinth is, Corinth is in modern-day Greece. And so he's writing to this church that he had planted during his uh, second missionary journey. Let me read these two verses, and then we'll go back and dissect them a bit. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may able, be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In this first verse and a half of this focal passage, uh, chapter, uh, verse 3 and the first part of verse 4, we really see, folks, a small sampling of God's blessings, of God's blessings. But I want you to recall what he said in verse 3, because or verse 2, because this really comes into play. He says, grace and peace. We were just talking about this a couple of weeks ago when we started our study in Ephesians that pretty much, with the exception of one, I think, of Paul's letters, he always starts off with grace and peace. And so that's something that he regularly says to the folks. And those words aren't just, you know, how's it or all those kind of things. I mean, grace and peace and are important in our lives. The grace that God gives, that idea of, of the old acronym is God's riches at Christ's expense. Undeserved merit. God giving us what we don't deserve. And peace. And the world talks about peace all the time and it seems that every new president that takes office wants to try to find peace in the Middle East. Just going to give you a prediction. It won't happen until God's ready for it to happen. But, but peace is much more than the absence of conflict. Peace is actually the presence of God. And peace speaks to, in a biblical sense, speaks to wholeness. And you really cannot have wholeness, healing in your life apart from Jesus Christ. We cannot be whole unless Jesus is at the center of our lives. And so I want you to kind of hang on to those two concepts as we go through this, because this is really going to tie back to that idea. But you'll notice in this verse 3 that Paul refers to God with three different titles. First he says, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Folks, 
grace and peace cannot be yours in this life or the next apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Catch that. You cannot have the true grace and peace of God apart from knowing Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord. Now, I will say this to you. We know that God pours His grace out on everyone. The fact that we're breathing air, the fact that we have clothes on our backs and food in our bellies, hopefully, those are from God. And Jesus makes it very clear that God reigns on the just and the unjust. And I used to not like that verse and thought, I don't always like the rain, but I've learned living in Kona to really like the rain because sometimes it's few and far between. But what Jesus was saying when when he said that was is that God pours out his love and grace on everybody, even people that are cursing his name. God pours that out. But you can't know the true grace of God apart from Jesus Christ. Any peace, any grace, any mercy, any comfort that we ever hope to have in our lives is going to be directly related to faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that as we go down through this this morning. Second of all, he refers to them as being the father of mercies. Let me give you another word for mercy because I don't know. I think mercy is one of those words that we maybe lost contact with in our modern English language. Maybe a better word for us in the 21st century would be the word compassion. That maybe ring a little bit of a bell with you? The image is here of one who sees our pitiful state and whose heart is moved to compassion, to literally do something about it in the end. And then finally, and this is where it kind of reaches to, is he calls him the God of all comfort. That word all in Scripture means one thing. You ready? All. All. Everything. Missing none. All means all. And the word comfort, again, is one of those words that I think we've missed. We, we, we think of comfort as, as, as consoling somebody or, you know, they're there. That's the idea of comfort that we see in our world today. But if you go back to the original Latin, our, our New Testament is written in the Greek, but in the Latin, con means with and fortis, comfort, fortis means strong. So originally comfort somebody meant to strengthen them, to spur them on in their lives. In the biblical Greek, this word means to call somebody alongside. A form of this word is used to describe none other than the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside. And in actuality, in the original Greek language, it was talked about being somebody who was an advocate in court. In other words, an attorney, somebody who who comes alongside. So imagine, if you will, this word group speaks of somebody who is called alongside us to guide us and to strengthen us. That's the idea that we have here. So taken together, we see that God has compassion on those who are His children through faith in Jesus Christ, leading them and strengthening them. That's the concept that we have there. And you know, guys, I got to tell you, I like that a lot better than restricting him to just telling everything's going to be all right. That's not who God is. I think some people pray to God and that's all they're looking for is a, a hand stroke or something like that. But when times are tough, we need more than that, don't you? I do. When I'm struggling, I need somebody to tell me something more than some platitude. Oh, it's going to be okay. I'm looking for something more. And in the case of our God, not only may, will He lead us out of the tough patch, if that's His will, but at least He'll be there that if we need to go through it, He's going to be with us every step along the way. Thank God for that. The first part of verse 4 describes Him as coming alongside us to guide us and to empower us in all tribulations. Not some tribulations. All tribulations. Every single one of them. But you know, I've discovered in my own life, and and you don't have to raise your hands, but maybe you've been guilty of this. Far too often, I tend to pick and choose those challenges in my life that I want to give to God to help me with. It's like, well, God, I'm I'm, I'm pretty good with this one. I know what I'm doing. We were talking about that the other night, Paula, you know, right? When we get in in our familiar surroundings lots of times where we know the rhythm of our daily lives and and, and we kind of run up against something that we've seen before, we just reach back on our experience or or just our own know-how to get us through that. But God's there for all of that. I know my wife has heard this story so many times that she's probably sick of it, but I think it's always 
worthy to go back because there was this dear saint of God that had passed on many years ago now. And, 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 and she was this lady who, who struggled physically as long as I knew her. I knew her 20 years. And I used to come up to her and I'd say, how you doing? And she'd say, suffering. That was her response. That's, that's how she lived her life. She was, she was ill at health and had, had been that way for many, many years. But she just had this deep faith in Jesus Christ that carried her through each day. And, and she shared one time how she was at the grocery store and she filled her cart and she was ready to go. She needed one thing. She needed a can of peas. And she could not find the peas. I don't know, maybe they did to her what they've been doing to us at Walmart. They, you know, they moved the whole place around. All of a sudden, I, I always could go to that aisle and find that item. But now it's over there somewhere next to the flip-flops or whatever. So it could have been maybe Annie ran into that. But she, she said, I, I had everything I needed but the peas. And she said, and I needed to be somewhere. And this is a lady... This, this grocery store that she shopped at was in a little strip mall. And she used to stand out in front of that store in that strip mall every single week and give out tracts to people. Just witness. And, and I'm talking about a lady who was in her 80s in poor health. Would hand out tracts until they finally, believe it or not, ran her off. And they said, you can't do this anymore. But this is a place that she was very familiar with. And she said, I had things to do. And I'm just convinced that even though she didn't share what that was, it was probably to get back out there handing out tracts again. I just kind of have a feeling that might have been what it was. She was a worrier for Jesus Christ. But she said she's going through the store, and she's, she, she said, I went through two or three aisles, and I just wasn't found them. She said, so I just stopped in the aisle. And I bowed my head. I said, Lord, please help me find the peas so I can go home. And she said, I, I, I said, amen, and I lifted my head. And she said, I, I walked like just a few feet, and there were the peas. Like they'd been there all along. Folks, we can pray to God for the peace. Amen. <laughs> and I, unfortunately, too many times am fighting to find my peace in my life. And maybe you are too. But He's there for everything, every trial in our lives. He wants to be our guide. He wants to be our comfort. And you say, I don't need much comfort over peas. You may be surprised. Because it's P1 and P2 and P3. They kind of add up after a while. And all of a sudden, you're feeling pretty down about things. I told Christine yesterday, I was, I don't know, I was just bugged about a bunch of stuff. And I finally had to apologize to her yesterday afternoon. I said, I am just being grumpy today. And I apologize. I don't like being a grump. But sometimes it just kind of piles up on you, right? Anybody else like that? All of a sudden, you realize, I need to have a time out. I think adults need those sometimes as well. But folks, God is ready to lead you through these tribulations, even before you ask. Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, 8, your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So why do we wait? Why do we wait? Am I the only hardhead here? <laughs> Just want to make sure. Maybe I'm preaching to myself. Well, you guys get to enjoy the journey with me then. How about that? Well, folks, that's the blessing. Here's our privilege, and, and I would consider this a blessing as well. The second part of verse 4, did you see it there? Now, we need to give God the, the, the praise and the thanks because He is there to help us through everything. But that's not where it stops because this is where the pay it forward part comes. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Right? It doesn't just stop with us. By the way, I'm going to encourage you. Don't let this sermon stop with you. Take this and share it with somebody else. Just full disclosure, the first time I heard this passage preached was probably in, I know when it was. It was about the middle of 1992. I'd started, actually I was engaged to Christine at the time. I was just coming off being backslidden for about a dozen years. You guys know backslidden? Anybody ever been there? Yeah, I was real good at it for a long time. Started dating Christine, said, you're going to date me, you're going to go to church. First time, she said, uh, I'm leaving at such and such time. If you're there, if you're not there on time, I'm going to leave you. I was always late back then. I come rolling down the street. Here she comes the other direction, driving off. She wouldn't even look at me. It's like, you were late. <laughs> but I started going to that church with, What? No, I have not been late since without calling. 
Every man needs a good woman. Prabhu, you catching all this, brother? Our newlywed back there? Yeah, yeah. Anju, you keep him straight. He looks so good today. I told him, I said, he, I tell he's a married man. He came in here looking like a million bucks today. He looks sharp as a tack. Sorry, that was free. Um, but I, I was going to this church that, that, that she had drawn me to. And it, it, I tell you, you know, God is an amazing thing. And I just give you guys a small testimony. Christine encouraged me to start coming to church with her. I was, I was messed up. I was a messed up, backslidden Christian and needed a lot of work. And I started going to that church and the Lord started speaking into my life through that. Started getting discipled in a way I'd never been discipled before. I became active in that church. Eventually I started to work in a youth group. I became a deacon in that church. I became very active. And then one day the Lord called me into the ministry. And as would, as would be the Lord's way of doing it, 13 years after I first started attending that church, I became its pastor. Hallelujah. And I pastored there until the Lord called us to Hawaii. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, God, God can do amazing work. So that's, you got parents out there, grandparents, you got some kid or grandkid that's just messed up going off into the weeds. God's not done with them yet. God's not done with them yet. Don't give up on them. God is an amazing, redemptive God. And He can take our mess and He can turn it into something beautiful. And so just hang in there. Just keep praying for them. I know my parents, boy, oh boy. My mother shared with me one time, she goes, I've always loved you. But there was a time when I didn't like you very much. That's when I was that backslidden boy. And so, a young man. So, parents, don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your kids. Hey, that's a message somebody needed to hear today. So, God comforts us. Oh, so, I first heard this 27 years ago, this verse. And I've never, it's, it's never left me. It's never left me. And so maybe you need to take this and share it with somebody. Maybe you need to pay the sermon forward into somebody's life as well. Not just, not just act it out, but maybe some other believer who can then do it with somebody else as well. So I would just encourage that as we go forward today. But God comforts us so that we are able, are empowered to provide comfort, direction, and guidance to others who are going through their own struggles. Now, in this context, please understand that, that Paul is writing specifically about his own ability to comfort the Corinthians. I mean, he's, he's speaking that into them, but you've always got to think broader sense when you look at the Word of God, folks, because these are universal principles that the Lord has given us in the context of human situations so that we're given, for all intents and purposes, a, an object lesson through the lives of these people that we can, we can understand and then take on into our own lives in the 21st century. But... We are able to do this through the empowerment of the same Holy Spirit who comforts us and guides us through our struggles and turmoils. But there's no reason to limit this dynamic to believers. Catch this. And there's every reason to apply it to those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. One of the questions that believers are asked the most by those who don't believe in Jesus Christ is, why does God let bad things happen to good people? How many of you have had somebody ask you that question? Now, here's the, uh, here's the standard Christian response. Oh. Oh. Because it's a tough question. Because th the world is a tough place. It really is. There's a man named Bill Fay who wrote a wonderful discipleship package called Share Jesus Without Fear. It's a great evangelism package. And, and his answer is very simple. He said, because sin is in the world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the world has been a bad place. And it's not that God would desire that, but that's just the condition that we live in. I heard a story, and, and be careful with this, okay? Please be careful with this. Don't be trite. The story was told of a believer who was trying to, uh, to minister to uh, an unbeliever whose son had just been killed, his young son. And he asked, how could God let this happen? In actuality, he said, where was God when my son was killed? And he softly answered, the same place he was when his son was killed. Now, again, be careful with that. You come off too trite on that, and they're going to punch you in the mouth. Right? But understand the context that he's trying to give there. He's trying to open a door to explain who Jesus is. And that... He is the giver of all comfort. 
And that's where we can be. We as followers of Jesus Christ can offer those who aren't believers a comfort and guidance that comes only through Jesus Christ. Initially, we may serve them best by simply sitting with them. Think of the book of Job. Those three buddies that had showed up in the first seven days, they did the right thing. They just sat there and comforted Job. It was day eight when they tried to start fixing him that it got kind of messed up. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but sometimes our best ministry is to be there. The, the ministry of presence, it's called. But as the Holy Spirit guides you, you can tell them of the love and the mercy and care that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. We have a golden opportunity to not only comfort both believers and unbelievers when they're going through trials, but to give them the same type of comfort that God gives us. We may not be able to relate to everything that they're going through, but I know this, God can. Until you've lost a loved one, or you've been laid off, or you've had a house burned down, or you've gone through bankruptcy, you can't fully appreciate that someone in those situations is going through that, but God can. And just as He's able to guide you and comfort you, He can give, use you to provide that same type of comfort and guidance to them, whether they're a believer or not. Certainly, if He's brought you through a similar situation, I've, I've had family that's gone through houses burning down and losing children and, and, and all kinds of things. You know, if you've gone through that, the Lord can give you the wisdom to be able to speak into that situation. But the reality is that even if you've never been in their shoes, if you're a believer here, you know somebody who has. His name is Jesus. His words in John 16, 33 are true today as the day he said them. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's the message that we need to give to people who are hurting, whether they're believers or not. And I want to say to you this morning, as you're here with us at this place, this ministry was started primarily as an evangelistic ministry to tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. Our founder and his wife, a couple that founded this ministry 30 years ago, are right now in Taiwan, reaching the lost. They're in their mid-80s, folks. And he hasn't stopped that mission yet. But we are here. Are there... Say spiritual children, I guess in some ways some of you are. But uh, this ministry was developed and placed at this spot to reach those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. So I can tell you our greatest honor is you're here today if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you've never asked Him to forgive you for your sin, to repent from that, to ask Him to become the Lord and leader of your life, you can do that. And that grace and that peace that we were talking about at the beginning can be yours each and every day. I've had believers ask me, how do people that don't know Jesus go through the struggles that they go through? And I've been a believer for a long time and I, I kind of get that, right? And I've known too many people who don't know Jesus who as they've gone through the struggles of life and they're just looking into a dark abyss because they have no hope. Folks, there is no hope apart from Jesus Christ. But with Him, you have the hope of this life and the hope of the life to come. If you've never accepted Him as your Savior and Lord, you can do that today. I use the word sin, and that irritates people in the 21st century. Who are you to judge? It's not me. I don't judge, because I'm as big a mess up as anybody here. But sin says we've all fallen short of God's glory, God's standard of perfection. And we all have. I meet people and they say, I'm pretty good. I said, why do you say that? They say, well, I've kept the Ten Commandments. I said, really, you'd be the first one outside of Jesus to do it. <laughs> Have you ever taken a pen home from work that wasn't yours? You ever said a bad word about somebody? Jesus says, murder starts in the heart. You ever lusted after somebody? You ever put yourself ahead of God? That puts you on the throne. That's idolatry, folks. Everybody's broken it. And James, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you miss any of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So just one slip up sometime in your life. Man, I'm lucky if I haven't slipped up since church started. <laughs> Are you 
Well, yeah, I am. I actually was giving that some thought for a second. <laughs> Starting to run the inventory. Folks, do you see what I have to put up with here? I got people keeping me straight. Wow. I'm so glad of that. No. Sin is the human condition that says I'm king of my world. And that separates us from God forever. But Jesus Christ came to this earth, gave His life freely on a cross, died for the sin of the world. He never sinned. And because He perfectly fulfilled the plan that God had given Him, He rose from the dead three days later and He never died again. And Scriptures tell us that if you conf confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. That means saved from your sin. Saved from the punishment of sin that is facing every human being that leaves this world without Jesus Christ. Saved to a relationship with God the Father. And saved to an eternity with Him. Are you still going to go through stuff? Christians, are you still going to go through stuff after you know Jesus? Yes. Absolutely. I think some people think when you accept Jesus, your bank account's going to be full and people are just going to be putting down the red carpet for you. Nah, not so much. But I tell you what, He's going to guide you through it in a different way that you've never experienced before. And the truth of this passage will be your truth. And then you can pay it forward into the lives of others that you know, know and love. God has blessed us by not only knowing every detail of life's trials, but by pouring out His grace, His care, and His guidance. He's empowered us to show that same grace, that same care, that same guidance to others as they go through their own trials and tribulations. We need to love others enough to bless them as God has blessed us. We need to pay it forward in their lives. I've always liked the band U2. And they have a song that came out many years ago now. By that same time, I was hearing this sermon for the first time. A song called One. Just almost a throwaway lyric in there. He sings, we get to carry each other. Not, we've got to carry each other. We get to carry each other. That's what it means to pay it forward. Because folks, it's not a burden. It's a privilege. Amen. Can we bow our heads please?